All right, well, good evening. Welcome to 412 Church. Let's try this all over again. Uh, it's good to see you all. This is the Wednesday Night Bible Study. I am Pastor Roy, one of the pastors here. You guys get to be with me on Wednesday nights. We're going to have a fun and exciting journey. Before we get into all that, let's go ahead and pray and start this night. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so grateful that we are able to come together, Lord. We're grateful for you and your word. We're grateful for the opportunities that we have to just dig into the truths that you have for us, Lord. We're grateful for the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life, Lord. And truly, we're grateful for the fact that we can continually learn more about you, grow deeper in our relationship with you, and truly understand the importance of who you are and what you have for each and every one of us. Lord, we ask that during our time together that you would give us hearts to understand, to see your story, of your son, our savior, Lord, and the plan that you would put in place to save each and every person, Lord. We pray that your blessing would be upon us. We pray that our hearts would be right, that we could take in and understand. And truly, I pray that I could you deliver your words and be a vessel used by you, Lord. Lord, we thank you and we pray all these things. And everyone said, amen, amen. Well, again, welcome. We are in a new series and this series is, it's exciting to me. It's taken a lot of work to get it ready for you guys. A lot of planning, even mistakes, because I'm. I, there's just so much information and so much going into it. But the series that we're gonna be looking at is called The Gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're gonna look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in chronological order. And we're gonna start today, and we're gonna end at Christmas. And you guys are like, oh, that's nothing. That to me, as I was looking through it, it is a short time, not as short as it could be, but it's also not as long as it could be, because I realized just looking at Jesus' life and the Gospels and the different things that are there, we could have spent like a year and a half just in the third year of Jesus' ministry. But we're going to look at it. We're going to take a 30,000 view flight over. So we're going to look at a lot of passages. Some, some, sometimes we come together. We're going to look at a few passages sometimes. We're going to explore through it. It's going to be a great time. We're going to see the entirety of the gospel put together as we bring again the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John together. And it's going to be a great time. And I was debating how do like you intro something like this? Well, my brain was spent on everything. So as I was sitting there, it realized, well, to start simple with a simple question, what is the gospel? Now, you don't have to answer that out loud. And if you would have, I wouldn't have, I'm just I would have listened. But I like asking this question to people. What's the gospel? Because everyone has an answer to what the gospel is to them. You know, some people tell you that the gospel is the fact that God, Jesus loves you. And they're partially right, but to be honest with you, they're not fully right. Some people tell me when you ask them what the gospel is, it's, it's the fact that Jesus died for you. Again, Partially right, but not fully right. Uh, this is one that I've heard um, over the years from, again, people that have been in church for a long time to people that have been in church for a short time, people that don't fully understand, non-saved people. They say that the gospel is Jesus making, makes you better or Jesus making you better. That one's totally wrong, and that's really hard when you break that one to them. But do you know what the most common answer I get from people when you ask them what is the answer, what is the gospel? No answer at all. Unfortunately, a lot of people, Christians, um, that go to church in America, so Western Christianity Christians, don't know what the gospel is. Unfortunately, there's so many different versions of the gospel and not in a good way. They're stolen from the gospel. They're out there that many do not have an answer when you ask them, what is the gospel? So to start this, I'm gonna give you three answers. The very simple answer, the long answer, and the one sentence answer, okay? So the short answer, you can write this one down. The gospel literally means good news, all right? Simple answer for someone. But now you have a situation at hand. What happens when someone asks you, what's the good news? Uh, I don't know, the teacher didn't tell me that answer. <laughs> he, he told you, you just weren't listening. 
Now I'm gonna give you the long answer, so bear with me for this. I wanna make sure I say this right. It's not gonna go on the slide for you to see because it's too long. But I'm gonna give you the long answer, the entirety of the gospel. So the gospel is the good news that the final and full enjoyment of the glory of God is found in the person and work of Jesus. That God, sovereign and eternal, has made this world for his glory and his goodness. He created mankind with his own image and likeness, but through our rebellion, foolishness, and sin, we, being you and me, and everyone who has or will ever live, has fallen and separated ourselves from God forever. But, this is where it changes, but in his, being God's everlasting love, prepared his own son as a sacrifice for our sins, taking on human flesh to live as we should and to die as we deserve, suffering God's wrath and overcoming death, hell, and the grave in our place and giving us grace. And that, through faith, all who believe will be saved and reconciled to the Father once and for all to know love and serve him forever for his glory, our joy, and the good of others. Continuing here, this, is, this and only this is the power to save. Saved by grace through faith from God to God for God, his glory, and the good of of others. If we miss this, then we miss everything. If we add to or take away from this, we miss everything. This is it. Nothing less, nothing more. Jesus. So that's the long answer. The one sentence answer, all right, is this. The gospel is, broadly speaking, the whole of scripture. More narrowly, the gospel is the good news concerning Christ and the way of salvation. That is the gospel. That is the good news. And I know what you're saying. Hey, I got this cool definition. What's the next thing they always ask you? Show me where it's at in the Bible. I have you covered, okay? There is actually a place in the New Testament that lists the elements of the gospel clearly laid out. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. So now you got the easy answer, right? What's the gospel? Good news. You got the long answer, right? We'll skip to the one sentence answer. You got the one sentence answer. And when they sit there and say, where's it at? You can say, oh, I actually know this. And you don't have to sit there and go, wait a minute. Let me go look back through my notes probably and find it. That's okay. But you'll know where to find it. So over the course that we're going to be looking at the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're going to travel through the four gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are the four first books of the New Testament. For the most part, we're going to travel through the gospels in chronological order. But I'm going to tell you right now, we're going to jump sometimes. We're going to be sitting there and going in order, and then all of a sudden we may jump further into a book, or we may jump backwards into a book. And I'll tell you why now, and I'll remind you when we get there. Sometimes when Jesus shared like a story or he did some certain things, he didn't do it always once. You know like how sometimes the pastor doesn't always deliver the same, he'll repeat a message. Jesus delivered messages multiple times at different places. So where Mark may have heard the message here, Luke may have heard the message over here, but we're gonna bring them together, okay? The other cool thing about the gospels and that we can move through the story of Jesus is certain parts of the gospel and scriptures match up with history. So we have defined lines to know how to go forward and where to go forward. Now, the gospels, as we will look through them, there's specific events in the ministry of Jesus that Matthew, Mark, and Luke record. They're also known as the synoptic gospels. But then there's John, And John, like, fills in some other holes and some other things. You see, if you read the Gospel of John, you realize he doesn't include Jesus' birth, Jesus' baptism, Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, the teaching in parables, the Last Supper, the agony of Gethsemane, or the ascension. But he fills in holes where Matthew, Mark, and Luke do touch on those things. You see, the first three Gospels center on Jesus' ministry in Galilee. 
and the work that he did. Where John focuses on what Jesus did and said in Jerusalem. So they put all the pieces together as we're going to blend it here and look. And each of the Gospels, which is really cool that the way that God did this and did it through each of these guys, each Gospel has a specific origin or look, way of looking at Jesus, which is great. And when, but when we put them all together, we get to see the full picture of Jesus. So keeping in mind with that, Matthew shows us that Jesus came from Abraham through David and demonstrates that he is the Messiah promised in the Old Testament. All right, so that's Matthew's focus. Now, Mark has a different look. Mark shows Jesus came from Nazareth and demonstrated that Jesus is a servant. He came to serve. And then there's Luke. Luke shows us that Jesus came from Adam, demonstrating that Jesus is the perfect man. And then lastly, John, he shows us that Jesus came from heaven, demonstrating that Jesus is God. So we're going to take all of these, their views, we're going to put them into the pot. I've sorted it all out. We're going to work through it, and we're going to come to the end. And the crazy thing is, even from these guys, I'm pretty sure there's stuff we won't ever know, we won't ever hear about, because there was so much that took place in Jesus' ministry, even as short as it was in three years, so much that John said this in John, in his gospel, in John 21, 25, And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. So yes, we're getting a picture, a view, and we're going to take that picture and that view, and we're going to travel through, in a sense, looking at the gospel of Jesus via Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. So to break down for you. So to set you on the pace of how we're going to travel through this, we're going to begin from the birth of Jesus to the beginning of his ministry. So we're going to start at the beginning, in essence. Then we're going to look at the first year and a half of Jesus' ministry. Then we're going to look at the second year of Jesus' ministry, followed by, of course, what's next, the third year of Jesus' ministry. Remember, this works better with you guys. I know it's late. (laughs) I love you all. So... The third year, then we're going to go into the last week of Jesus' ministry. And of course, nothing is complete till we come to the end. So we're going to follow it up and close it out with the 40 days from the resurrection to the ascension and see the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ in this way. So we're going to journey through the four gospels and the count, looking at the events and ministries of Jesus Christ to see the gospel of Jesus Christ. The title of tonight's message is The Prelude. And we're going to be in Mark chapter 1, if you want to mark it right now, Luke chapter 1, John chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1, remember I told you about that whole jumping thing, Luke chapter 3, all right? So we're going to start at the beginning. So if you want to go to it first, we're going to go to Mark chapter 1 and look at verse 1 first, and then from there, put a holder in it, we're going to jump over to Luke chapter 1 and look at the first four verses of Luke. So, I'll give you a minute to get there. All right, minutes up. I know. Mark is on page 1682, if you have my Bible. If you don't, I can't help you. Uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 1 says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of of God. All right, now jump over to Luke chapter 1. We're going to read the first four verses, picking up in Luke chapter 1, verse 1. It says, Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theopolis, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. So, we're going to pause right here, looking at these two passages, and we see what we could title this as the beginning. 
all right? Now, I don't know about you, but when you hear someone tell you something and they say they want to start at the beginning, you know it's going to be good. If they just jump into it, you're like, oh, I know I'm missing something right now. But they go, hey, let me back up and start at the beginning. You go, oh boy, this is going to be great. We're starting at the beginning. The gospel of Jesus is no different. As we read in Mark, it said the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. Mark kind of is a quick gospel. And I like Mark because I also dubbed it the ADHD gospel. Because Mark, when the way he writes, it's like you would think that, oh my gosh, Jesus did all that in three years. Holy cow. Because he just hits event after event after event after event. And there's like no pause in anywhere, shape, or form of it. He just goes. And it makes it sound like, wow, Jesus' ministry must have been busy and fast paced. Because he starts right into it with the beginning and then goes. Now, Luke. He wrote his gospel knowing that many others had already been written. What it was was Matthew and Mark had already written theirs, and probably some other people wrote some stories about Jesus going on. But he's also, the way that you look at it, you see he says there he's writing this as an account saying, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, telling us that Luke took the time to like interview people and get to know people, and find out really what happened, and he shares that in his gospel. These eyewitnesses from the ministers being the other apostles that would have been with him, the disciples. Maybe it was even from the larger groups, like the 72 that Jesus sent out that we'll see about. Maybe even some of the things he got, he got from firsthand from like Mary and Martha, or Mary Magdalene, or Lazarus, or Nicodemus. He got it from the source, And he shares it with us. And it's kind of crazy because you read here, Luke's account almost sounds off like he's given a, a, basically a defense account of what took place. And he wants you to have the facts, ma'am, straight to it. And you're like, oh, this is going to be it. He was a doctor, so he's probably more factual, more scientific and thought things through but he's giving it to you in that regards. Both gospels accounts start at the beginning But now I want to transition to John. We're going to look at John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. Because John takes a different approach. He doesn't just start at the beginning. He starts at the beginning. So, if you have your Bibles, John chapter 1. Picking up in verse 1. You guys there? Okay, I'll give you 30 seconds. Okay, how about 4? All right, John chapter one, verse one says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. He goes on in verse six and continues, says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not the light, but it was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him. And the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But it says in verse 12, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And it says in verse 14, The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. 
the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So we're going to stop right here. Like I said, in this section, we see not just the beginning, but the beginning, beginning. I was told that wasn't proper, but I'm okay with it. John takes a totally different approach than Mark and Luke. And while others started out with Jesus and his ministry, John wants readers to understand that not just what Jesus' ministry was about, but who Jesus was. And he didn't begin with his work here on earth. Truly, Jesus began the gospel at the beginning. And when I mean the beginning, we're talking before Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God. Prior to that. So it's the beginning, beginning. John's prologue here introduces some major ideas that he will work through and that we will see throughout the gospel of Jesus. Beginning with Christ who came as a light into the world, suffered rejection, but gave grace upon grace to those that received him. But also in this opening statement, John displays the greatness of Christ, the greatness of Christ's love, and the greatness of Christ's grace. This prologue truly gives us a summary of the gospel account for the reader to see and understand who Jesus is, the Son of God. So I want to camp out here today for a bit and look at this. And the first thing that I want to look at, as we've said in this, as John has set up for us, is the greatness of Christ. And the greatness of Christ is kind of spills out into some different attributes and aspects of who Christ is. And the first one that we see here is we see first that Christ eternally preexisted. In the beginning was the Word, is what John wrote. There was never a time Christ did not exist because he was. And the crazy thing about the word was here, if we look at it in the Greek imperfect tense, which I don't know what any of that means anymore, I forgot, but I have a definition, so we're good. Was means was continuing. With this insight, verse one of John chapter one takes different light because if we read it with this was continuing, this is how we would read it. In the beginning was continuing the word. And the word was continuing with God. And the word was continually God. This can be summed up as one person says, again, not grammatically correct, but he said it this way, Jesus always was wasing. Did you get that? Jesus always was wasing. I can't believe I said it straight. Simply meaning Jesus pre-existed and he is continuing to be. So looking at the greatness of Christ, the first thing that we see is he eternally pre-existed. The second thing that we see is he eternally, the eternal relationship. As we continue, we said the word was with God, meaning that the father and the son were continually together. Truly, we see the two aspects of the Trinity here, knowing the fact that all three parts were there, but we see the two gathered together here, showing this perfect, joyous uh, intimacy, intimacy that the Father had with the Son. It was a closeness that no one could even picture or imagine, but was there. The third thing that we see in this greatness of Christ is the eternally God. As the verse goes on, it says the word was God, meaning exactly that. We don't have to sit there and dissect it and fight over and argue about the tenses and the different verbs and that. It's simply enough in the sense that we see in the essence of the character of God, but the character and essence of Jesus Christ. Yes, he is separate in identity, but he is also God. And the fourth thing that we see in the greatness of Christ here is eternally creator. Jesus is the creator of the universe. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. And the great thing is, not only do we have this here in John, but throughout the Gospels and throughout the New Testament, we see over and over again that this bears witness of Christ. As can be found in Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, or here in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, in the second half of the verse where it says, whom he was appointed heir of all things, though whom also he made 
the worlds. You see, Jesus is the creator of the universe. He created all, and it holds to bear truth that as creator, he knows us. He knows our needs. He knows our wants. He knows us personally. So first, we've seen here the greatness of Christ. The second thing that we see here is the greatness of Christ's love. Christ's love is so apparent in these opening verses here of John's uh, gospel. We see here that the way that John shows the love of Christ is in form of light. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness. And here we see the emphasis is Christ is the light, but not the light of just life, our spiritual life. And giving light to the dark world as a benefit, light can be seen. Verse 9 goes on to tell us that the true light that was there was in every man coming into the world, but the light also does what? It dissipates darkness. God loves us so much that he sent his son to be the light so we can see the truth that is before us. He reached into this world to shine a light to dissipate the darkness of the world. But the sad thing was, the darkness didn't comprehend it. The light was met with resistance. And why? They didn't want to come out of the darkness. As the verse tells us in verses 10 and 11, the light was rejected. It came to the world that it created. They knew him, but yet at the same point in time, They rejected Christ. They did not receive him. Let that sink in for a moment. The one who created the world came as a light to save those in the world was rejected by the creation. But did you notice there, it wasn't everyone. Not all rejected him. We read that those that received the light became children of God. That statement that John makes here hit him in his ministry so much that it stuck with him that later on when he wrote 1 John, he actually drove back to this. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, Paul or John wrote, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That is some amazing love. It's a bright, joyous future for the children of God who come to the marvelous light. So we've seen the greatness of Christ. We've seen the greatness of Christ's love. And lastly, we see the greatness of Christ's grace. As John concludes this opening statement, he shifts from light and love to grace. John explains that the word became flesh and dealt in and with man and woman so they could see his glory. John describes the experience this way in verses 16 and 17. He says, And of the fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Did you notice it said grace for grace there? It's interesting, right? which had me thinking, what type of grace is that? I went over to other translations because I wanted to see how they worded it, and one said grace upon grace. Another said grace from his fullness. And I'm still thinking, how do I get that grace? Because this grace sounds way more than just grace. The crazy thing here is, this isn't a special grace. Truly, the translation that sums it up best and said it is grace following grace. The way that I could explain it to you is this. When we come to Christ, we receive his grace. But as we go through life and we deal with things and we grow, guess what? More grace comes upon us and more grace comes upon us and the grace never runs out. It continues. It's grace following grace, continuing to overflow in our lives Paul said that there would be those without grace, but grace was available to all. 
when he said this in Romans chapter five, verse 20, but where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Telling us that there is enough grace to cover one's sins so that we can live a victorious life in Christ. For those who know Christ, this makes total sense. To those on the outside, it makes no sense. How could this be? Because we have received grace following grace. We know that, yes, God washes over us and forgives us and pours out his grace upon us as we walk with him. And then John comes to the close of the passage in verse 18 and says, no one has ever seen God, the one and only son who is himself God and is in the father's side. He has revealed him. We see here in this passage, the greatness of Christ explains the greatness of the father. The greatness of Christ's love explains the greatness of the father's love. And the greatness of Christ's grace explains the greatness of the Father's grace. To close out as we've been looking, so we looked at the beginning. We looked at the beginning, beginning. Nothing's better than getting family history, right? So first, we're gonna look at Matthew chapter one, verses one through 17. And then we're gonna jump over to Luke chapter three, verse 23. So I don't know how you wanna go, but if you're gonna go backwards, I'd stop at Luke first and then go to Matthew. So, Flip, 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 flip. How come they don't make Bibles with a ton of bookmark pages in them? All right. So, this is really going to test me. You guys already know I can't say words right. I can't say names right either. And I'm going to rely on the fact that... um, I might just say the first letter of the name, okay? Matthew, chapter one, verse one, says the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Real quick, just to understand here, what Matthew's gonna lay out here in this genealogy is he's gonna show who Christ is as far as falling under the line of David, but also taking it back, not just to David, but to Abraham, all right? So he begins in verse two and says, Abraham begot Isaac. Okay, so you know, I know this is the section you all skip over anyways when you do your yearly Bible readings, so you can't judge me on anything. There's a lot of begots going on here, okay? So Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, Jacob begot Judah and his brothers, Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar, note that. Perez begot Hezron, Hezron begot Ram, Ram begot, yeah, I'm not even trying that one. A, A begot Nashalon, Nashalon begot Salmon, Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab, Boaz begot Obed by Ruth, note that. Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. All right, so we went from Abraham to King David. Then it says there in this rest of verse six, David the king begot Solomon by her, who had been the wife of Uriah, note that. Solomon got Rehoboam, Rehoboam begot Abijah, and Abijah begot Asha, Asha begot Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat begot Joram, Joram begot Uzziah, Uzziah begot Jotham, Jotham begot Ahaz, Ahaz begot Hezekiah, Hezekiah begot Manasseh, Manasseh begot Amon, Amon begot Josiah, Josiah begot that's a tough one. And we're going to say Mr. J and his brothers about the time they were carried away to Babylon. So now we're at the Babylon captivity. Verse 12 says, after they were brought to Babylon, Mr. J begot, man, dude, Mr. S. And Mr. S begot, I can say that one, Zerezebel. Zerezebel begot Abuda, no, that's wrong, Mr. A. Mr. A begot Elohim, Elohim begot Azor, Azor begot Elazara, Elazara begot Mathana, Mathana begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Verse 17, so all the genealogies of, from Abraham to David are 14 generations, from David until the captivity of Babylon are 14 generations, and from the captivity of Babylon until Christ are 14 generations. 
And now we're going to jump over to Luke chapter 3, and then I'll tell you some interesting stuff about this. So that was Matthew's account of starting his gospel with the genealogy of Jesus Christ from back to David and back to Abraham. Know this, side note real quick, this was not the blood lineage, but the legal lineage to King David. Now we come to Luke chapter 3, verse 23, and you're like, wait a minute, Roy, this is where I told you. Guys put things at different spots. The reason Luke put it here, he actually tells us, but I'll give you a heads up ahead of time. He went through some other things, talking about Christ's birth and all these different things. He listed the genealogy right before Jesus started his ministry at the age of 30. So his earthly ministry, he lists the genealogy that we read here. And starting in verse 23, it says, Now Jesus himself began his ministry at about the age of 30. See, I told you. Beginning as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Heli, and the son of Matah, and the son of Levi, and the son of Mekai, and the son of Janna, and the son of Joseph, and the son of Mathahatha. I don't know if I did that one right. The son of Amos, and the son of Nahum, and the son of Eli, and the son of Nagai, and the son of Matha, and the son of, there's that one again, Mr. M, and the son of Mr. S, and the son of Joseph, and the son of Judah, and the son of Johannes, and the son of Mr. R, the son of Zerezebel, and the son of Mr. S again, and the son of Ner, or Nier, Nyai, and the son of Melchi, and the son of Adai, and the son of Kosam. Man, these people had some names. <laughs> the son of Elmodam, El- Elodam, the son of Ur. That was a tough one. Hey, what's with this one? The son of Jose? The son of Eliezer, the son of Jorim, the son of Mathahat, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Johan, the son of Elohim, the son of Malia, the son of Mena, the son of, they like that name, Mathahatha, <laughs> the son of Nathan, there's an easy one, the son of David, so we're at King David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Salmon, the son of Nashon, the son of Am Aminda, I don't know, the son of Ram, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham. Oh, we're at Abraham, but wait, we're not done yet. The son of Tahar, the son of Nah, nah Nanor, the son of, I don't know, it starts with an S, the son of Ru, the son of Peleg, the son of Ebner, the son of Shelah, the son of Cana, the son of, oh yeah, that's a fun one, Mr. A. The son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, I know that one, the son of Jared, the son of Matahalah, I don't know, I messed up that one, the son of Canaan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, and the son of Adam, the son of God. Woo! That was fun. So here we see family history. Matthew starts the genealogy of Christ. And so Matthew begins his account with the life of Jesus Christ, looking from Abraham to Joseph and the genealogy that exists to make the claim again for the throne of David through the legal lineage through the father. But in his way of doing this, Matthew connects Jesus to David, but he goes back further because you know how it is sometimes you want to make sure you put the person in the right family. So he says, I'm not just going to connect him with David. We're going to go all the way back to Abraham. And he makes that connection there to understand that, this, that Jesus is far to the seed of Abraham in whom all nations would be blessed, as it says in Genesis chapter 12. Also, this genealogy is interesting because it has an unusual presence of four people in it. Typically, when you look at a genealogy this way, it follows upon the fathers. But Matthew throws in four people, which happens to be four women that play a significant part in this ancient genealogy. It's a special note of the example of God's grace and his plan of how he would take unlikely people and use them in great ways. The first name that I told you to note there in Matthew chapter one as we were reading through the genealogy was 
Tamra. Tamra has an interesting story. You see, she sold herself as a prostitute to her father-in-law, Judah, to bring forth Perez and Zaha in Genesis chapter 38. Without that account happening, we couldn't go forward. The next person that I told you to note there in Matthew's um, account of the genealogy is Rahab. Rahab was a Gentile prostitute of whom God took extraordinary measures to not just save her, but save her for judgment and took her away from the lifestyle again of prostitution, which can be read about in Joshua chapter two and Joshua chapter six. Then we jump to another name I told you to note in there, Ruth. Ruth was from Moab, also another Gentile who came to the land of Israel, as you can read about in the book of Ruth. And then there's the last one. It said, her who had been the wife of Uriah. I think that was a fancy way to be like, you know, we want to pay homage to Uriah because he got killed by David and not drop Bathsheba's name. I don't know. But just so you know, that's Bathsheba, okay? Bathsheba, if you don't know about her, basically she's the one that David had the affair with and had her husband killed, which you can read about in 2 Samuel chapter 11. These four women have an important place in the genealogy of Jesus to demonstrate that Jesus identifies with sinners. Even in his genealogy, he identifies with us, not let alone his birth, his baptism, his life, and his death on the cross, but his genealogy. He identifies with us sinners. All that is good, and it's clear, and it shows the lineage of it. But then you go over to Luke, and Luke's lineage is not the legal lineage, it's the blood lineage to show the line of Jesus to David for the throne. But he decides to take it all the way back to the beginning and say, look, not only is he of the lineage of David by blood, but it goes all the way back to Adam, the first son of God. Crazy. The reason, again, that it, this was mentioned here I told you about that jumping thing was because a priest or a rabbi that was a teacher wouldn't start their ministry until they became a 30 years of age because they figured they were mature enough then. I don't know, I've met some 30 year olds. You guys know me, that could be interesting. <laughs> but he did this. Luke does this in a way of going all the way back to Adam, showing that Jesus not just belonged to the seed of Abraham, but he belonged to all mankind, not just the Jewish people, but he is for all people. So there's our opening. There's our look at our prelude into the gospel of Jesus Christ. Each time we come together, we'll come to the end. And as you guys know what, I have a question for you to think about. It's called, so what? So what did we listen to all this for, Roy? That's a good question. Here's the question that I have for us. Do we understand the power of the gospel? Power is something that we never quite fully understand until we see it unleashed. And even when we see it unleashed, sometimes we're still amazed by it and we don't fully understand the power that is there. Romans 1.16 says this, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to first the Jew and also to the Greek. The word that Paul uses in this verse, in the Greek word of power, is where we get our English word dynamite. Think about this. Dynamite's explosive, right? Anybody ever play with dynamite? Okay, you don't have to answer that question. They do record this. Um, dynamite's explosive. Think about the passage here. I am not ashamed of the explosive power of the gospel. The gospel should permeate all of our thinking, not just our carnal pursuit to please God or wanting to give him the glory that we think he's due, but the power of the gospel changes lives, which should drive our motive to live a life for God and to share that power with as many people that we can get him in contact with 
But know this, without that power, to be honest with you, the Christian ministry would be as flat as a soda with no power. Remember, the gospel brings life. And how potent is the gospel in your life? The gospel is like a core of a nuclear reactor. When it's let loose, all that power is amazing. The creativity and what will happen, we would be amazed to watch it become unleashed. But unfortunately, the gospel, even in Christian, Western Christianity, churches, is never fully unleashed. It's like the flat soda. When we hear the words of the gospel. So often we hear I am not ashamed, but we refer back to just as I am. We forget about the power. We forget of what really is taking place in our lives, the change that has happened. And rarely do we see the power of the gospel unleashed for salvation. Throughout history, it comes to points, but then it simmers down. People get encouraged and spike up, and we've seen it in Western Christianity with the, um, oh, I just spaced on the whole movement now. Oh, well, never mind. Revival movement, that's what it was. All right, I got it. My brain's is like five miles ahead, sorry. The revival movement, it exploded, but then it went back in. And so often in our life, we come to Christ, and there's that explosion but then something happens that brings it back in. And that explosion never gets bigger again. It subsides and does. But if we were to truly believe, if we've received him and believe his name and gave and become children of God, as it said in John chapter one, verse 12, how much should that power, that light be exploding out of each and every one of us. As John wrote in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, see what kind of love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. That power is the power that should be living in each and every one of us. And it's because of the power of the gospel that our lives were changed and that we became children of God. And he has granted to us this ability to do amazing things, but we withhold that power. The love of God has been shed in our hearts. We know when we came to know Christ and the wisdom that we gained of God. He gave us understanding that we didn't have before. He gave us ability to do things that we couldn't do before. We should allow that holiness to begin to develop in our lives and allow the power of the gospel to go forth so that truly we can claim and say, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. There is so much power that God has had to be released that we have held back because we don't quite grasp the power of the gospel. And over this time, again, this journey that we're going to go through, we're going to see the power of the gospel in Jesus Christ and what he has for each and every one of us. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to just dig into your word. And even as we start, Lord, I pray that you will help to keep us focused on the things that you would have. Again, we're grateful that we could come together and to learn and grow in our relationship with you. I pray for each of my brothers and sisters as they go throughout their week, the things that they have, the things that they'll be doing, that you will just guide them and direct them. But truly, I would pray that they would allow the power of the gospel to come to life in their lights and to be a light to this dark world. Amen. Amen.